What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy Brad back with another video. Long time no see. Are you listening? Nurse Pass. Beast mode. Uh, I hope everybody's been doing well. What I wanted to do is I wanted to make a video today giving you a little bit of a case study of, of one particular patient that is a fictional patient, just a culmination of different patient experiences that I've had over my years, all brought down into one little patient presentation. I wanted to go over this and uh, I kind of wanted to gear this towards, I mean, this is applicable to current practicing ICU nurses or CBICU, whether you're in medical or cardiac, uh, but also for nursing students who are interested in these concepts of advanced hemodynamics and understanding how it's very important. What you're learning right now is going to be applicable throughout your career, right? Uh, pharmacology, the lab values, tying in the patient's history, their presenting symptoms and making it all work. Um, and again, this is just real life. This is just patient experiences that I've had. So. Uh, I'm going to be looking over here because I've written down a couple of notes as far as like the patient uh, demographics and things of that nature and the vital signs I'm going to provide for you. But this will all be presented on the screen for you just to follow along with me. So what we have here is a 76 year old male. This patient is a full code. Known history on this patient is that they have congestive heart failure with a known EF of 25 percent. Coronary artery disease having prior PCI with stent to their LAD, PCI being percutaneous coronary intervention, right? They had a stent placed in their coronary artery. Stent to their LAD. Um, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. We see these things all the time. They all go hand in hand and they make for a really bad recipe for our human bodies. So let's think about this. They're admitted now to us with complaints of shortness of breath and chest pain times one week. Chest pain, big deal, big deal. What are we thinking immediately, right? And this is just a free flowing format as I'm gonna be talking here. So this is not some formal structured video. What are we thinking? Lord have mercy, are they having a heart attack? Okay, well, are they having a STEMI? Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but what are we gonna do? What's the gold standard? Let's get an EKG, ECG. Well, we get an EKG on this patient and the EKG is negative for any ST deviation at all. There's no ST elevation. It's not a non-STEMI. There's no depression, none of that. No evidence of ischemia or infarction based on this EKG. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna get an initial set of vital signs. So what do our initial set of vital signs show? Well, we have a temperature of 100.5, heart rate 112, blood pressure 80 over 40, O2 saturations of 93% and respiratory rate of 22. This is just the data that you're being presented with. So I want you to keep all of these things in the back of your mind. Okay, well, we're tachycardic and we're hypotensive. Well, we're probably having compensatory tachycardia, heart beating faster to try and produce a larger cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Compensatory tachycardia because we are hypotensive. Blood pressure's 80s over 40s. Vasodilated. The pump's pumping harder, trying to keep up the requirements that our organs need. Okay, so what are we thinking here? Our O2 sats are also 93%. We're hypotensive. This is, and this, they're symptomatically hypotensive, right? They're, they're lightheaded. They feel like crap. They're having chest pain. Okay, well, <clears throat> we need to remedy that. What's the first thing that we might be thinking about? Well, IV fluid resuscitation. That's something that you may consider, but let's think about also the fact that this patient has congestive heart failure. They have a known EF of 25%. Maybe they're looking a little edematous and puffy when they come in. I don't know. Um, and they have O2 saturations of 93%. So, you know, you're thinking about you giving a patient, pumping them up with fluid. If they have known congestive heart failure, fluid's going to third space. It's going to pump into your interstitial tissues, pump into that pleural cavity, maybe give you some pleural effusions, <laughs> making that O2, that respiratory status worse is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, without being too silly. So, well, maybe we're going to get them on a vasoactive drip just to get that blood pressure up. <laughs> Instead of fluid resuscitation, maybe we're going to get that blood pressure up that way. Now, let's just say that we do. Uh, maybe they choose phenylephrine as the vasoactive drip of choice instead of, you know, primarily alpha uh, receptor activation instead of maybe something like a, a norepinephrine, a levofed drip or an epinephrine drip where this patient's already tachycardic. We're in the one teens. We're approaching that, that direction. These could compound the tachycardia, right? So anyway... 
let's say they start them on a neo drip, phenylephrine, neosinephrine drip, also known as neo. Okay, so we get them started on that. Blood pressure starts to come up. Let's do some further diagnostic work. So we get some lab values on this patient. We have a sodium of 141, K of 51, creatinine 1.21, white count of 16, hemoglobin of 9. I want you, we're going to put these all on the screen here and then we'll, we'll go over them, I guess. Platelets of 300, troponins, let's say they're in the 2000s. Our BNP is in the 4000s and our lactic acid is 6.3. That's a lot of data that I just presented you with. Let's go over that kind of quickly here, or briefly, I should say, maybe not quickly. Sodium of 141, cool, sounds great. K, 5-1, all right. I, I'm i in the cardiac ICU. We're getting up there a little bit now, <laughs> but but we're, we're within range. Creatinine of 1.21. We have no known history of chronic kidney disease, despite the fact that this patient has congestive heart failure with an EF of 25%. Usually those things go hand in hand over time thinking about your kidneys chronically being hypoperfused because you have a failing pump in your heart. But anyway, that's just a side note. Okay. Creatinine of 1.21 with no known chronic kidney disease. And you have a patient who's coming in hypotensive. I'm thinking that we have an acute kidney injury. Okay. So we have 1.21. White count of 16. Why do we have a white count of 16? Think about these things. Maybe there's, I don't know if there's some physical assessment finding or not that may warrant why they have a white count of 16, but that's abnormal. Hemoglobin of nine. Okay, well that's low. Why? Why could that be? Maybe they, like I said, maybe they are presenting edematous. Maybe when we listen to them because they have an O2 sat of 93%, we're right on the borderline on room air. Maybe they have some fine crackles in there. They do have congestive heart failure. Maybe they're fluid overloaded. We do then see also we have troponins in the 2000s we have BNP, B-type natriuretic peptide in the 4,000s. That's the direct linking <laughs> lab result <laughs> that correlates with heart failure. It's, a, it's something that gets released by our body whenever we're in severe heart failure. So our BNP is elevated. Maybe we're hearing fine crackles. O2 sats 93%. Maybe we are volume overloaded. That would make sense, right? We think about that with congestive heart failure patients. Maybe we're volume overloaded already, and maybe we're hemodilutional, and maybe we have too much volume, too few red blood cells, and maybe that's why our hemoglobin is nine. Troponin 2000s, okay. Well, patient came in with chest pain. We were thinking STEMI. ECG ruled that out. Why are our troponins still elevated? Potentially in this instance, it's something called cardiac demand ischemia. You're hypotensive. Your organs in your body are not getting as much blood and oxygen as they should be. Your heart is also one of those organs that's being fed via your coronary arteries. If the rest of your body and organs are hypoperfused, it stands to reason that your heart is too. It's called demand ischemia. Your heart's working hard, baby, and it needs some help. <laughs> and we also see this systemic hypoperfusion as evidenced by that lactic acid of 6.3. Again, whenever you have a lack of oxygen being delivered to the tissues of your body, your body then flips over to an anaerobic process of ATP production. You may remember the Krebs cycle. Well, anyway, one of those byproducts is lactic acid. And this lactic acid is elevated at 6.3. We have congestive heart failure. We don't have any evidence of there being an active STEMI. We need a little bit more further diagnostic workup, and it would probably stand to reason with a patient with this extensive of a cardiac history that we would get a left-right heart cath. So we get a left-right heart cath. Everything is clean from a coronary standpoint. Stents are patent. We see that our invasive cardiac hemodynamics, we have a cardiac output in like the five range. Cardiac indexes are in like the 2.5 range. Those are good. I mean, that's, you know, for a patient who has an EF of 25%, that's, they're looking pretty good right now. Okay. So we're, what we're trying to do right there with that is rule out this being a cardiogenic shock component, because what we're looking at right now is our patient is in some form of shock. We are hypotensive. We're not in a hemorrhagic shock because our hemoglobin is nine. Our BNP is elevated. So, I mean, heck, are we in a cardiogenic shock situation? because we're in an acute congestive heart failure exacerbation episode. Well, our cardiac output and our cardiac indexes now rule that out. 
so instead of maybe starting the patient on, this would lead us to think, do we need to start the patient on some sort of positive inotrope, like milrinone, for instance, to increase that cardiac contractility so that the heart doesn't have to work as hard and pump against as much resistance to pump against as high of an afterload. Cardiac output and cardiac index look pretty good. And speaking of afterload, well, what does our afterload look like in this set of cardiac hemodynamics? We're looking at an SVR or systemic vascular resistance of 400. Boy, that is in the tank. That's in the tank. That's low. An SVR of 400 is low. What does that tell us? That tells us that our afterload, the the vessels that we our left ventricle has to pump against to give blood out of our heart to the rest of the tissues of our body instead of like it being a clamped down pipe this thing is so vasodilated the svr is so vasodilated and low that we are in a state of systemic shock we are in a state of septic shock what we have here ladies and gentlemen <laughs> this is kind of the summary i guess is a patient who were originally presented with shortness of breath and chest pain which we at first were thinking was a STEMI. ecg ruled that out big cardiac history in this patient labs troponins bnps pointing towards us being in a state of Cardiogenic shock, creatinine elevated, 1.21. Cardiogenic shock, potentially. Lactic acid is elevated also. We know we're in shock. But then our cardiac diagnostics, as we get further into it, show that our cardiac system is actually doing okay, but our SVR is in the tank. And whenever we take that SVR of 400 and couple that with the white count of 16 and couple that with the temperature of 100.5 and all of these constellation of symptoms, maybe we start to think that our patient is in a state of septic shock. Maybe we're gonna start sending off blood cultures and getting the ball rolling on some prophylactic antibiotics. So anyway, just a little bit of a thought experiment of a patient presentation, and obviously, everybody's different. This is just a fictional patient. This could have gone any which direction, but just a cool little way for you to work through a couple of different scenarios as you're getting patient symptoms and presentation presented to you to work down the line of potential causes for this patient's state of shock that they're presenting with. It's been a while since I've made any videos, and I really hope that you enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like. If you're new here, consider subscribing. I do intend on making new videos, and if you have any recommendations about things that you're currently encountering in nursing school or as a nurse, then let me know. Maybe we can all talk about it in the comments below. I look forward to seeing you in the next one, and I will talk to you soon. Peace.